Well, thank you for uh, attending this session. I want to just share with you about the flipped classroom. So I want to just also thank Margaret and Stephen and the times that I got to spend with you guys um, this morning. So I'm using some new software here, um, uh, iStudio Live, to, to present this. And hopefully this will be a, a little more engaging and interactive than our session this morning where we got cut off. And I know that was a little... Uh, uh, troublesome, but hopefully that will give you some idea. So, as as you know, of course, uh, I'm John Bergman, and we want to talk about how flipped learning really helps Procter and Gamble rethink the salon styling program. So let's let's talk through this as we go through. So, as I said earlier, hi, um, I um, at my heart am a teacher. So I've spent most of my life as a teacher. I. I started teaching in 1986, teaching students, um, and mostly in a secondary education here in the United States. But uh, what we're doing has a lot of implications for, um, for the corporate world and particularly for Procter & Gamble. So I'm a teacher who believes, though, in something very important. And what I truly believe in and what makes good teaching good is actually um, the relationships. What matters is the connections that we can have with our students, the relationships. And, and I know that, you know, I have an advantage as a, as a high school science teacher in that I saw my students every day. And for you, you saw your students kind of, you know, you see them occasionally. But I still think it's very important to understand that, that the connections that you make make a difference. You know, the old adage that at least we use here in the United States is that students don't care what you know until they know that you care. So making those connections is such an important thing. So I want to walk you through some technology through my career as a teacher. And I think that this will be very powerful for us to understand how the world has changed because we're moving to a sort of a different paradigm of education. So when I first started teaching in 1986, the technology I had available to me was this. That's right, all I had was a chalkboard. I needed something more readily available than that. And so a couple years later, I got an upgrade. I got a crazy cool technological upgrade, and I got one of these. Yes, that's called an overhead projector. I got one of those. I thought it was the cool thing because I could face my students. And then a number of years later, I got something even cooler. I got one of these projectors that could, could do a PowerPoint. I thought it was the best thing in all the world. But you know, there's really a problem with this first picture Oops, this second picture and this third picture. You see, I was the center of attention. Students came and they got information from me. And we need to do something more than just get information from us. And I think this really leads us to the future of education. The future of education has to do with delivering direct instruction, not to the whole group, but to the individual. And I think that's what makes a huge difference. So I see us in a, in a world of change. And when I say that the world is changing, I want to illustrate this like with my cell phone in a minute. But you see, when I first started teaching, if I wanted access to information, I got information from the heads of my teachers, from textbooks, and from libraries. But the world has significantly changed. You see, the world, all i got to do is grab my, my device and I can do this. What is the population of Italy? The population of Italy is about 60,783,000. I didn't know that. I didn't know that was true. Or I can do this. Who is the president of Italy? Let me check on that. <laughs> That's funny. The answer is Giorgio Napolitano. See, I didn't know the answer to that question. But my, my phone does. The world has fundamentally changed. And I think this picture I'm about to share with you tells how the world has fundamentally changed. If These are two pictures taken at the Vatican in Italy. Of, of people waiting for the new pope to arrive, one time in 2005 and one last year in 2013. Look how the world has dramatically changed. Look at this picture and notice the second picture and how it, uh, there's so many people with a device. How has the world changed? Oh my gosh, so significantly. We've, we've gone from an information scarce world to an information saturated world. So what I, I think what we need to do is we need to move from this classroom, this classroom where the teacher is the center of attention, to these classrooms where projects are emphasized, where, where students are having conversations. This is the classrooms that we need to move to where they're, where they're actually using the content. We want them to use the content. That is the key. And so um, I think to illustrate this is I want to use a, a, this image to say I think we have school backwards. So uh, this may not completely translate in, in, uh, around the world, but there's a sport in America called bowling. And this guy's actually doing it backwards. <laughs> You're supposed to actually face forward when you do this. He's doing it backwards. So you need to um, uh, think of schools backwards. I'll bet many of you have had this experience at the kitchen table with your son or daughter. You have sat there, and they've been confused, and they're trying to help them on their homework, and they're lost. So if you've been there, as I have with my own children, you've reached this point. And I think the issue is what we're doing, at least in, 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 in uh, primary and secondary education, is that we're sending our students home to do the hard stuff. 
the hard stuff. Now, I know that's a deep, deep word, not really, is that what do I mean by the hard stuff? So to, to illustrate the hard stuff, I want to talk about um, uh, 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 an educational theorist who came up with an idea in the 1970s and 1980s. You might, may not be familiar with him. His name is Benjamin Bloom. So in, in 1970s and 80s, Benjamin Bloom um, came up with this, what's called Bloom's Taxonomy. It is a, a way to look at cognition. So if you look at cognition, he, he basically said, oops. sorry, I'm trying to get my pin turned on. Basically what he was saying is that there was, there's levels of, of information and cognition and there's the lower level of remembering and understanding. And so those two lower levels, and as you go up, there's application, analysis, and evaluation. And you see, we spend a lot of our class time teaching students stuff. Now, in your case, as hair salon uh, trainers, you're going to be teaching them how to do remembering and understanding. And then you're going to let them apply a little bit. But my contention is that we need to spend more time doing the application. So what I really mean by that is we're going to flip Bloom's taxonomy. In that we flip Bloom's taxonomy, you're going to spend your class time doing the application. That's where they're learning how to do this. And then ultimately, you want them creating. You want them in the studio creating content, which is actually creating uh, creating uh, beautiful works of art, really, in people's hair. So ultimately, it comes down to this. What is the best use of your face-to-face -face class time? You see, you only have a certain amount of time. So again, I had an advantage as a primary and a secondary teacher with my students, and I saw them every day. You're going to see your students kind of on a more infrequent basis. So how are you going to use that time? And I would argue that the way you want to use your time is you want to do something more rich, more meaningful, and more valuable. So what does that look like? Well, I think in your case, you want more time, as, as, I, as I heard from, from Stephen when I was in Los Angeles, in the hair. <laughs> you want them... Uh, touching people's hair and styling the hair in ways. And it, you can't really do that if all you, I mean, how should I say this? You can't really do that unless you are giving them more time. Um, as I talked with Margaret and Stephen, the, the conversation was that you're spending a lot of time in the class teaching stuff to teachers. And you don't want to just teach stuff to teachers. You want them to learn the content. So let's watch a short video clip that explains the flipped classroom. I'm Aaron Sams and I teach science here at Woodland Park High School. My ultimate goal, I guess, as a teacher is to help students become learners who can learn for themselves and by themselves. One of the problems that I was guilty of even prior to flipping my classroom around was the classroom was centered around me. I told them exactly what to learn, how to learn it, what assignments to do to learn it, and when to learn it, and how to prove to me that they learned it. I don't do that anymore. We changed the place in which content is delivered. Instead of standing in front of a class and delivering, here's how you do this type of problem, here's how this works, um, I deliver that direct instruction now asynchronously at home through these videos that we make with Camtasia Studio. Times till whole. Oh, we didn't do that last, the last time. the last step, they were already whole numbers. We had one, one, and yeah. four. Here, we don't have a whole number. So here's a few little tricks when you need to multiply by whole numbers. If one of your numbers ends in 0.5, you're gonna multiply by two. All right, something 0.5 times it by two. Right. Okay, write this down, guys. Yes, if something ends in 0.3 or 0.33 or 0.66, you multiply by three. And when the kids come to class, they don't show up to learn new stuff. They show up to apply the, the things that they learn at home and to ask me questions about the things they learned at home. So now they could have my, my lesson, if you will, what I would normally have stood up and lectured to them in class with some added features, they get that at home, and then what they were expected to do for, uh, for homework is now what they do in my class. Life is different for me because I, don't, I no longer am the guy who stands up in the front of the classroom and just yaks at a student for an hour, or what, however long the class is. Now I walk around the, the class and I help kids. I, I'm a tutor, I'm a guide, I'm uh, the putter outer of fires, whatever it happens to be um, in my crazy chemistry class, I walk around and do that. I don't stand up front and teach under the kind of a traditional model. I'm Aaron Sams, I'm a teacher, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, and I love Camtasia Studio. So hopefully that emphasizes the idea that the flipped classroom is this moving of this direct instruction to the individual space. 
And so um, some other examples that I've seen that I think are powerful, especially in light of, of more practical subjects like you teach, is I want to share this one right here, another video clip. Um, this is from a woodworking teacher in Sweden. And uh, what he did with the flip classroom is pretty cool. So let's, let's take a, a, a look at this one. see what he has done is of course he is taking uh, his class time to make stuff right uh, he, they are making uh, salt and pepper shakers they're making things like that and I think what Leif has done is very practical to what you're going to be doing in um, in hair salon styling because you want your 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 teachers or I mean part you want your your students who are going to be the, the the stylist to use and to make stuff not 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 salt and pepper shakers but but beautiful hair and so um, here's another example from a sports medicine class that I think is also powerful. And I think I have to click play. It's really helpful for me for the lab portion that we do. We put that on a video and then to watch the night before. I can spend more time walking around and helping each group versus I found in the past I was taking 15 minutes of this lab time, which I've only given 42 minutes right. of complete lecture. What are these kids doing? So like right here, what are these girls doing? Well, right now we're measuring range of motion. They're using a tool called a goniometer okay. and we are on the hip. We've already done the ankle and the knee. Now we're doing the hip and what they're measuring right now is internal and external rotation of the hip. So you can see in that case that she wanted the students to have time doing sort of labs, if you will. That's so important for kids to see and, and to do. It, it's by practicing, by doing. And so um, we've got a couple of books, and I just wanted to say that these books have been very instrumental in helping a lot of folks think through the flipped classroom. And I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, though... Uh, the, though they're not necessarily obviously in the in your sector, the first book, Flip Your Classroom, has actually made a lot of impact in um, the business world, and I think it'd be a valuable resource for you to possibly pick up. So you could get resources from where you could get that. And 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 I talked through this too this morning, and I think it's important to kind of talk through what is flip learning. So we're going to walk through this definition a little bit, one sort of step at a time. So it's this pedagogical. Now there's a big fancy word, pedagogical. You may not know that word, but that is the science of learning. So um, there's a science of learning and it's called pedagogy or pedagogical. So this flip learning is this pedagogical approach where you move the direct instruction. That's the, where you're speaking to all the students at once from the group space. So where you're presenting this to the whole group to the individual learning space, which is what you're doing now. You're watching this now on your own and you can consume this at your own pace because some of you are struggling with this because I have a very strong American accent and that might be difficult for you to understand, but you can pause and you can rewind me. And then it makes the resulting group space and it turns it into this dynamic learning environment where you're actually doing the work. And I think this is particularly applicable for what you're doing. And they're going to apply well, application. That's actually them practicing what you're trying to teach. How amazing is that? And then I want to just make a couple of comments on hair salon stylists that I think um, make a difference. As I chatted with, with Margaret and Stephen um, in, in, in preparations for this presentation, they said that they want more time in the hair, as we talked about earlier, but also that a lot of your students who come to you um, have been at school, but maybe they were not successful in the academic schools. They're, they're creative people who want more time to work, and that's so important that they have more hands-on opportunities because oftentimes they've been in schools and they've been frustrated at their schools. Why have they been frustrated? Because they never had time to express their creativity and they've not had time to, um, you know, touch the hair, so to speak. So I encourage you to think about how this model will significantly impact um, the Wella um, a product that you have. And so at this point, of course, we did the Q&A. And so I want to just, hopefully this will be a great way to get your mind thinking about how you can rethink the flip classroom. And actually, I want to say one other thing um, that I talked about this morning, that, that as you think through the flip classroom, I believe there's four hurdles to flipping the classroom. The first hurdle is that you need to, and, and this is what I've been really trying to do for the first part here, is you need to rethink what education looks like. So the first hurdle is what I call thinking. 
The second hurdle we talked about this morning was is technology. There is a technological component to this. I'm using some technology here, some really cool technology, using this uh, thing called iStudio. It's very, very powerful, um, and it's a great technological tool. It's actually relatively easy to use. It looks pretty fancy, but there's this, there's this role. It's going to change you from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side, and so this second one about technology, you, you're going to have to learn some stuff. So there is a learning curve. I get it. And then the third T, or the third hurdle, is uh, time. You need to have some time to go through this change. I get it, change is hard. So the third T is time. And the last T is training. You're going to have to retrain yourself on how to teach. Again, you're going to move away from the front of the room and you're going to come and you're going to work amongst your students. I mean, I tell the story that um, there was a joke at my schools. They said, uh, you know, when a visitor would come to my class to, to, for whatever reason, they'd say, we can never find you, Mr. Bergman. You're always with your students which I took as a compliment. Because when they walked into almost every other class, they walked in and where'd they see the teacher? Standing at the front of the room. This is not just about the front of the room, it's about working with every student. So I encourage you to rethink what school looks like, take some time to learn, use the right technology, and get the appropriate training. Thank you very much.